And so towards the end of my PhD, maybe it was around 2013, 2014, about a decade ago, I had sort of this epiphany that computers and machines would be able to um, accelerate our, our ability to, to program biology. That's obviously because advents in uh, compute power and uh, the advances that I saw of machines and AI in other areas. I don't know, that's something to think about, right? As, as a world, how do we want our world to be like? Uh, do we want to be compassionate with each other and help each other or do we want to be more individualistic? So yeah, a lot of bacteria have developed persistence to, you know, in some cases, every antibiotic that, yeah, that we have within our arsenal of antibiotics in hospitals and in the clinic and in pharmacies. And that's the big problem that we face now. There, there are a lot of patients coming into the hospital with untreatable infections that are multi-drug resistant, um, where uh, the pathogen, the bacterial pathogen is resistant to everything that we have. And so it's really very worrisome. And uh, that's why we need new, new types of antibiotics. So we need to innovate in this, in this space. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Future Hacker. This is your host, Maria Taigi. You know, how can intersection of nature and machines help us advance in medicine? Cesar de la Fuente explores the potential of machine biology to develop computer-made drugs and solve some of the greatest challenges for global health. He's a presidential assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where he leads the machine biology group whose goal is to combine the power of machines and biology to understand, prevent, and treat infectious diseases. Current application areas in his lab include developing novel approaches for antibiotic discovery, building tools for microbiome engineering, and creating low-cost diagnosis. In 2019, MIT Technology Review recognized De La Fonte as one of the world's top innovators for his work in digitizing evolution to create improved antibiotics. He has received over 60 national and international awards, has more than 85 peer-reviewed publications, and you know, I'm really looking forward to beginning this interview, says that unfortunately I won't be able to do justice with a proper introduction here and all your achievements. And it's the second time he's here at Future Hacker, the first time, but for a Spanish channel. Thank you so much for being here with us again. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be back, uh, back here with you. So Cesar, you know, let's begin by the very beginning. Can you explain our listeners what machine biology is and how it contributes to research for the search for disease cures and prevention? What roles does technology play in this field? Yeah, sure. So, so my lifelong passion has been to, since I was a kid, uh, to understand biology at a fundamental level and then try to use those principles to try to improve the world. And, um, and so throughout my career and my life, I've, I've devoted a lot of energy in trying to understand biology. You can track that through even through my undergrad studies where, you know, I, I realized that, uh, that uh, biology was multilingual, yet, right? You, you couldn't explain it with just one discipline. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, physics, you can, you can primarily explain it with mathematics, but in, in the case of biology, you need uh, to incorporate, uh, you know, chemistry, mathematics, physics, and many other disciplines to try to understand it. And so for my undergrad, for example, I, I did bioengineering and biotechnology, and I tried to learn as much as possible uh, from all those disciplines. Uh, and then uh, later on, I started working with sort of the simplest um, living organisms, which are bacteria, to try to understand how they work. Um, and also try to uh, learn from the workhorses of life that allow uh, life to, to occur as we know it, uh, which are proteins and peptides, which are small proteins. And, um, and so, you know, that took me to my PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of British Columbia, where I did that. And I, I worked very intensely in, in trying to understand those biological systems, right, proteins and microbes uh, to a level that 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 um, that I could use that information further uh, and then uh, but uh, towards the end of my PhD I you know I became dissatisfied with our inability to program biology so uh, if you wanted to mutate a protein or a peptide you had to always uh, do the mutation and then go back to the drawing board and check whether that mutation uh, did something that was predictable and it, it was really sort of painstaking work uh, that require really 
a massive trial and error experimentation. And so towards the end of my PhD, maybe it was around 2013, 2014, about a decade ago, um, I had sort of this epiphany that computers and machines would be able to um, accelerate our ability to, to program biology. And uh, that's obviously because of advents in compute power and uh, the advances that I saw of machines and AI in other areas. And so then um, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to go to MIT, uh, which uh, at the time was sort of the mecca for AI. Uh, people were using AI in other application areas, not, not in biology or chemistry, but in um, pattern recognition uh things to do image and speech recognition for example and so i sort of immersed myself into that world and uh and i learned as much as i could to sort of uh, take some of these principles and some of these concepts to apply to biology and specifically the the, the project i would focus on with uh, with my great collaborators was to actually uh try to accelerate use of machines to accelerate antibiotic discovery and um we you know, we started with this project where we wanted to, you know, the first question right back in the day was, how do we teach a computer to create an antibiotic, to create a yeah. molecule, to create a, a, chem, a chemical compound? And, um, and of course, that was not trivial at the time. And so we, well, with the, the solution that we came up with was to uh, train the computer to mimic uh, Darwin's algorithm of evolution. And, uh, and so uh, we trained the computer to execute uh, evolutionary programming and uh, we fed it some molecules from nature and then the computer was able to evolve them into something better to, to serve better antibiotics and um, and that really so we then we synthesized some of those molecules that the computer created and we tested them in, in animal models and they, they were able to reduce infections in an animal model so that really opened up um, a whole new area of research uh, where people are using AI and computers for antibiotic discovery and then uh, I, I was recruited at the University of Pennsylvania, where I am now, and where we started sort of the machine biology group, uh, where we're uh, sort of converging all these things that I've learned throughout my career and my life um, into one laboratory, into one group. Uh, then very privileged to be leading, and um, I'm lucky that uh, I get to work every day with people that come from different backgrounds, yeah. uh, including you know chemistry, computer science, physics, microbiology. Uh, to try to tackle some of these big problems I was trying to tackle. But that's sort of like the inception of machine biology and this concept at the intersection between machines and biology. That's how it came to be. It was a multi-year process, I would say. It was a lifelong process that has culminated in in now the group that we have here at, uh, at UPenn. It sounds so amazing, Cesar, especially all this multidisciplinary approach uh, and merging, you know, biology with technologies. Uh, what have been the main challenges uh, you've been facing in the field? I mean, there have been numerous challenges, um, uh, starting with when we initially started uh, asking the question, you know, can machines even yeah. uh, help, you know, accelerate the antibiotic discovery? Can can we use them to design a new type, type of antibiotic? That was obviously, now it seems obvious, but five, six years ago, that was, uh, that was certainly not, not trivial. And so we we sort of had to do a lot of trial and error in our thinking of how do we do this? You know, how do we encode the chemical complexity of molecules into a code that is, is computer understandable? Then how do we teach the computer to evolve in that initial study to evolve the molecules to make them, uh, turn them into a, a more optimized antibiotic molecule? And so that required a lot of uh, really thinking, brainstorming with the team, with collaborators. Um, you know, more recent work uh, that we've done where we develop algorithms to mine uh, for the very first time the hemoproteome. These are all the proteins encoded in our genome uh, as a source of antibiotics. And, um, and that, uh, that required also a leap in um, conception because up to that point, we, were all, we had only developed methods to mine one protein at a time to see if we could find antibiotics hidden with that protein. Uh, but... Uh, but here we, we realized that we could scale that to entire proteomes, all the proteins encoded in an organism. And so we did this exploration of the human proteome and that, you know, led us to discover thousands of new local encrypted peptides, which are hidden sequences that are um, sort of encapsulated within uh, proteins of our, of our body. 
and that were previously unrecognized without my, my career activity. And so, I mean, every step of the way, we've had many, many challenges, both on the computational side and on the experimental side, and then also, but also surprises, right? Like, we didn't necessarily expect to find as many antibiotics as we, as we found the human protein, for example. Yeah. And then we followed up that work with many, many other offshoots that, uh, that I'm happy to discuss. And uh, so just we have this idea of timing, right? So from the day that you had this epif epiphany and you started doing all the testing and discoveries until, you know, you got into Pennsylvania, how, how long did it take this journey? Yeah, so, I mean, let's see. So uh, in my late teens, that's when I started my undergrad uh, degree uh, in biotechnology. You know, the degree was sort of bioengineering, chemical engineering, and a couple of biology. Uh, you know, that was in my late teens. And in my early 20s, I started my PhD at the University of British Columbia. Uh, towards my mid to late 20s, then that's when I was recruited to MIT for my postdoc. And then in my early 30s, uh, I started my faculty position here at, at UPenn. So, you know, it was basically, you know, around uh, over a decade. Yeah, the whole process. yeah, yeah. But I... Like I mentioned, Maria, like I would argue that uh, I was this was a lifelong process in the sense that I was already dreaming about uh, the intersection between nature, biology, and machines uh, as a kid. I mean, I remember it's amazing. Uh, you know, watching movies like uh, Blade Runner or uh, mm -hmm. Matrix and thinking about how artificial intelligence and machines can can help uh, sort of enhance in some ways yeah. if you use them properly and so experience and enhance biology and the world. And also, I read a lot, as we did, um, you know, uh, books, Selfish Gene from Richard Lockheed, or On the Origin of Species, obviously, yeah. Charles Darwin, God bless her path, uh, from Pop Stutter, a lot of John von Neumann, uh, What is Life from Schrodinger, which was a great book of the transition between phys uh, from physicists into biology um, as a new frontier. And uh, so, so I've been really inspired by all of this from different perspectives movies books um even growing up and then i've i've been passionate about it throughout uh, my life and then i had opportunities to learn uh different skills along the way to try to apply them to, to understand the complexity of biology which is obviously depends biology is probably the most chaotic and, and complex discipline that there is and that's why it's so difficult to study and that's why it is i think uh considered the next frontier right? yes uh, of, of this century yes Amazing, amazing. And congratulations for your achievements, uh, Cesar. So, you know, uh, I, I separated a couple of, of specific topics so we can, you know, talk about. Um, in the past, you know, pandemics were confined to geographical areas. We didn't have people traveling so much. And then we faced, you know, recently COVID, all this global mobility has changed it into this uh, exponential speed that diseases get just spread. So how can we leverage our current technology to prevent the spread of future diseases on a global scale? Like, and do you think we have really learned with COVID? It was amazing what happened. The world got together, you know, we, we got all this uh, sharing of information and we were way beyond, I think, the interests of, you know, the pharma industry and we had to make it work, right? Was it a le lesson learned? Are we more prepared? I, I mean, absolutely. I think absolutely. I believe in uh, human learning, and I think we COVID was ex an extreme, extreme learning experience for everybody. Uh, but uh, some some positive takeaways were: our our we learned how to collaborate and how to cooperate um, amongst even different countries, and uh, and I think we can take that forward into the future, into future pandemics, uh, future challenges that we may face. Um, also, uh, you know how how quickly technology actually was able, and science was able to to provide solutions to to this sort of global pandemic. In this case, right? And I think uh, you know I'm a true believer in the the positive impact of scientific innovation. And uh, absolutely, I think we're you know in future challenges. Hopefully, uh, we use uh, some of the things that we've learned from this uh, the COVID pandemic. And we can uh, more readily apply them uh, in, in the future. But I mean, things like AI, I think, will certainly be instrumental in our ability to 
uh, to analyze data and uh, to our predictions from data and uh, into, into the future to sort of try to project um, the spread of disease or future outbreaks and things like that. Uh, but also simply, uh, you know, collaborating, and, uh, manufacturing and uh, delivering, deploying uh, medicines and tests into areas that perhaps need it the most. Um, that's something that we actually haven't seen in the COVID pandemic. And I think it's one of the things that, um, regrettably, uh, it's quite sad in the sense that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, developing countries still do not have access to COVID vaccines or or, uh, or diagnostic tests. And uh, and this is something that I think we need to learn from and try to improve in the future. I mean, uh, there are many countries where not even two or three percent of the population has been vaccinated. So I don't know, that's something to think about, right? As, as a world, uh, how do we want our world to be like? Uh, do we want to be compassionate with each other and help each other? Or do we want to be more individualistic? And uh, that's more of a philosophical question. Yes as to the kind of society that we want to live in. Yes, yes. And I'm wondering as well, the way that we got together and the way that uh, everybody collaborated with each other so we could, you know, have uh, vaccines in, in such an amazing speed. Uh, do, you, do, do you see that it just happens in a real humanity-threatened situation? Or were we able to keep this culture? Because we already have so many diseases that would benefit from that already today, currently, that if everybody got together, would have the benefit of, of finding those cures, uh, you know, uh, more rapidly. Or do you think that this is something that uh, we are just moved past private interests when there is a threat like that? Yeah, I think this is a great, interesting question, right? I mean, I, I do believe in humanity's ability to respond to big challenges at a global scale. I mean, that has been demonstrated over and over whenever there's been a global challenge. Yeah. You know, scientists, innovators have uh, stepped to the plate and have come up with some sort of solution. Uh, the problem is that we need that sense of urgency for something to happen. Uh, and uh, and we need also a lot of investment and a lot of focus has to be in a particular problem. So it's important to focus on one or two things at a time. And historically, it has been that way. Um, Unfortunately, we don't do that with everything. Uh, and uh, there are many examples, you know, in infectious diseases, you know, tuberculosis, for example, or uh, infections caused by antimicrobial resistant uh, bacteria, which is what, I, what we focus on in my lab, or, you know, HIV. And so if you think about some of these other things, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's a bit unfortunate, right? That uh, we can do it. I believe humanity can do it and resolve a lot of these problems, but. Uh, but we need a we need sort of a concerted effort. At least historically, it has been demonstrated that through concerted efforts and uh, focus on a particular problem, we can, we can do it. Um, but our, our ability to multitask in that sense is not has been hasn't been shown to be very good. Yes, and I, I completely understand. And actually, it, it was going to be one of my questions to you, so let, I I'm going to bring it forward first. Uh, how how usually and having your lab as an example is regarding prioritization, right? So. Uh, which type of diseases we're aiming first? Like, I understand that in your case, you're aiming bacteria in general, but when, when you have to choose from the investment you have, like the stakeholders you have, how is this decision made of, you know, which type of diseases or which type of cures, which type of presentations you're after? Yeah, that's a good question, right? I mean, our, our, our mission statement uh, says that we... Um, we use the power of machines to accelerate discoveries in biology of medicine. So it's quite broad. So our aspirations are quite broad. Yeah. What we're initially focusing on is infectious diseases and more specifically is bacterial yeah. infection. And so at least initially in the first years of the lab, we have focused on a targeting currently untreatable bacterial infections, which are, you know, to me, the, a key motivation for focusing on this is the following. It's actually one of the most underinvested areas in the world that kills the most people in the world. So uh, we saw an opportunity, a like, gap there where, you know, over 1 million people die every year from bacterial infections. Uh, and uh, there's barely, there's almost no investment from public or private uh, sources. And uh, so we, we, we thought that we could sort of fill that gap as, a, as, a, as an academic group. 
to try to provide alternative solutions to these or out-of-the-box solutions. The other thing is that antimicrobial resistant infections, they, like I said, they kill currently over 1 million people per year, but they're projected to kill 10 million people per year by 2050. And uh, that actually corresponds to one death every three seconds. So it's um, it's projected to surpass every other major cause of death in our society, including cancer. And uh, and so uh, you know we're very much hugely motivated by this. And um, and it's a problem that affects every corner of the world. So it's not only the Western world, the rich countries. So that's a huge motivation for us to to try to provide solutions by through the intersection between machines and biology. Uh, to a problem of this magnitude that affects so many people that ha that is so underinvested. And so I think uh, for us, that just motivates us to work hard every day. Yes, of course. Um, so back in 2021, you mentioned uh, UPenn was developing a technology that captures the natural progress in which virus enters our bodies and was including it in wearables and masks, providing real-time results. Uh, so by then you were searching for funding, if I'm not wrong. So do you have any follow-ups on that? Yeah, so we've continued our, our mostly academic work um, in this line of research. And uh, basically we just published a couple of papers this year. Uh, so one of them where we, we moved beyond SARS-CoV-2, beyond COVID-19. Uh, we were able to repurpose the technology to uh, detect uh, herpes simplex virus 1, which is... Uh, it's a huge, um, it's a huge problem in the world. It affects millions of people, and there, there are no good diagnostics for this virus. And so we apply that to, uh, to herpes, uh, simplex virus, and, um, and the other thing we did is that the previous prototypes that we had developed, um, they use as a substrate, um, PCB, which is uh, basically non-recyclable. It's a, it's, a, it's a compound that is not material that is non-recyclable, and so thinking about how we could innovate responsibly and create a diagnostic test that were green, uh, we replaced that PCB with um, cellulose that was not uh, that was made by bacteria. So we oh. actually um, culture bacteria that were able to make the cellulose and uh, we use cellulose as the substrate uh, for the test. So we're able to, uh, we published this paper where we described uh, uh, this diagnostic test for COVID-19 in that case, including, including many of the emerging variants that work, uh, but it was a green test. It was it's recyclable, so there are no issues afterwards of, of recycling. And, and that's a huge problem with the, with many, many of the tests that we uh, that, that, that are currently used, right? That the recyclability is, um, is, is, is a huge issue. Yeah. They're not biodegradable, right? Well, but so those are two, those are two updates. Th yeah. That's amazing, but what are the next steps? I think that you know the next steps is hopefully to see some of that technology being translated into something that helps people. Uh, we're not quite there yet, mm -hmm. uh, but that's obviously the dream. Okay. The dream that we have is that everything we do in the lab, um, both on the AI antibiotic work and the diagnostic work, is that someday, you know, we love publishing papers, of course, but um, the ultimate hope is that it helps people and helps humanity and it helps the world and. Uh, that continues to be our, our main motivation. And were you able to get the funding needed? Sure. We we were able to get enough funding to develop the prototypes okay. to a stage, to the speeds that we could in the lab with the capabilities and expertise that we have. Okay, great, awesome. Okay, so uh, so you mentioned this, you know, very scary future of, of uh, you know the amount of people that might die because of due to you know bacteria uh, diseases. I, I would guess that's because uh, bacteria are becoming uh, more resistant to antibiotics. Is that it? The reason? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, so basically, when you expose bacteria to, to an antibiotic, bacteria are the ultimate survivors. They're uh, amazed. They have the superpower of, of being able to adapt to new environments, including when you throw antibiotics at them. Uh, they're able to the, to. Uh, to develop, to mutate, and you know, develop resistance very quickly to antibiotics. And the reason for this is that bacteria, obviously, they uh, they uh, they they duplicate, so they they grow and they they divide in a time scale of minutes, right? So they're able to to build that mutation in a time scale of minutes, whereas you know, as humans, we can only do it once in our lifetime. So 
or twice. Uh, and so they have this huge ability to, to adapt to new environments. This is their superpower. And that's why they've been so successful throughout history, just sort of um, taking over new environments and colonizing new environments. And um, I just think it's fascinating to think of microbes, uh, bacteria, one of the earliest sort of living organisms to have ever existed. And, and that's for a reason, in the sense that the fact that they still exist. And so, uh, so yeah, a lot of bacteria have developed resistance to, you know, in some cases, every antibiotic that we have within our arsenal of antibiotics in hospitals and clinics and in pharmacies. And, uh, and that's the big problem that we face now. There, there are a lot of patients coming into the hospital with untreatable infections that are multi-drug resistant, um, where uh, the pathogen, the bacterial pathogen is resistant to everything that we have. So it's really, really very worrisome. And uh, that's why we need new, yes. new types of antibiotics. And we need to innovate in this in this space. Sorry, basically in in a race, uh, in a race against you know time to 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 be able to, and you know it just sounded too scary for me because uh, putting together everything you said that you know <laughs> how how the future looks like and that it's underfunded and also we need more investments on that. It's just a, a race against time uh, against those super bacteria, right? Uh, it's it's like strengthening the bodies response you know and maybe one thing that i heard uh from the interview that we gave eduardo to our spanish channel is that maybe you strengthening good bacteria uh, within our bodies and weaken the bad ones is it like a way to go i just i just think that super bacteria are super scary and listening to listening to you made me even more scared so you know how is this race against them going Yeah, I mean, I mean, there there are different alternative approaches, mm -hmm. right? That that people, us and others, have considered. One of them is, you know, could we boost our own immune system yeah. to clear bacterial infections? So that's through uh, immunomodulation, so modulating the immune system in ways that are helpful. Um, that's one avenue that we've pursued. We, you know, our group and others, uh, and, uh, and that seems to be a promising avenue. So you can. There are ways where you can. They find molecules that you, you put them into mice and they boost the, the immune system of the mouse to accelerate the clearance of infection. The other uh, opportunity um, that people have pursued is the use of probiotics or, or engineering probiotics, which are, of course, good bacteria, such as the ones that you find in yogurt, uh, in a way that they can actually target the bad bacteria and they target the pathogens. And that's another avenue that, that, is, that is interesting. Uh, the primary avenue that we take is we, we build small proteins called peptides that, are, that can target very effectively bacterial pathogens. Other people are using, for example, viruses that only affect bacterial cells and not human cells. These are called bacteriophages. And some people are also pursuing, you know, designing and discovering bacteriophages to target it. So there's, there's a multitude of, of avenues here. And I think it's great to have many uh, so that ultimately, hopefully, Apple that work. Okay. So uh, during a, a previous interview, um, you mentioned also that AI-generated medicines are not yet on the market. I don't know if that changed since then. Uh, mainly due to... No, yeah, not yet. And that's because of this lengthy approval process, mm -hmm. right? All the testing and everything, which can take up to a decade, you said, right? So uh, is, isn't there any way that, you know, technology could also uh, expedite this process? And, you know, I, I, I may be asking something really stupid and I'm, I'm sorry about that. But uh, just as we have, no. just as we have like, you know, flight simulators, right? We have, you know, we, you have all the variables. Uh, do you see that it will ever be possible to have a machine that is able to simulate all the uh, thousands and, and thousands of responses of the bodies? And I know that each body is very specific, but we do have all the variables, right? Is there something that somehow we could use a machine and use technology to be able to simulating all the responses and all of the results when, when, when trying a new medicine in an effort to speed up this process? Yeah, I mean, first of all, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, every question is valid. And, uh, you know, I think in a, in a, in a dream future that, that, you know, might be possible. But if I, if I reflect in our progress in the last five, six years, you know, over half a decade or so, um, I think one of the things that I would have never anticipated that we'd be able to do with machines 
is we've been able to accelerate the rate of discovery of antibiotics. So using traditional methods, it takes between three and six years to discover potential preclinical candidates, right? And now using machines, we can discover thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of preclinical candidates in a matter of hours. So if I think about our, our ability to accelerate antibiotic discovery with machines, that would be my main conclusion over the last half a decade or so. And that, if you had asked me six years ago, you know, will it be possible in six years to, to really accelerate the rate of discovery by many orders of magnitude? Instead of having to wait years, you can do it in hours. I would have said probably not, uh, but we can now do that. And I think that has been an amazing achievement uh, and amazing progress um, combining machines and experimentation in the lab. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would say that that has been really the main, uh, in the field of antibiotics, the main advance so far has been our ability to accelerate discovery, then our ability to then, like where you're saying, like simulate how the antibiotic interacts with within the body, the complexity of the body, I think it's going to take us many, many years to, to achieve. That's a, it's, it's an even much more complicated problem. And, uh, and, and certainly multi-objective yes. uh, optimization problem that, that, that we're, not, we're really not quite there yet. I mean, uh, the application of AI in biology is, is at its infancy, right? I would say it's only a couple of years, like five years old. And so we still have a, a long, long way to go. I, I, I think that I, I and I, co I completely see that, you know, thinking about today's technology. But uh, when we think about, uh, you know, the advancements maybe in, in quantum computing and the ability to analyze this amount of data that we're not currently able to, I don't know, who knows? It makes me a little more hopeful, right? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of uh, unpredictable, what's going to happen with quantum computing and its applicability to biology and chemistry. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential there and a lot of promise, but it's, it remains to be, to be seen. Yes. Um, so your lab is also involved in uh, this project uh, related to molecular de-extinction, right? Uh, are, are you guys still working on that? Yeah, yeah. So this uh, basically we published a number of papers this year, uh, 2023. Uh, where, uh, well, we published the first preprint in 2022, but the paper uh, came out uh, peer-reviewed in 2023, the first one. Uh, this is the the concept uh, that uh, that we can resurrect chemistries from the past mm -hmm. to face present-day problems. So that's the main concept behind uh, molecular extinction. And um, and yeah, maybe I'll give you a bit of the context as, as to how this started. Yes, so please. we. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, but we developed this algorithm to mine the human proteome for the first time as a source of antibiotics. Uh, and we found thousands of these encrypted sequences, right? And then, you know, we hypothesized that uh, most likely we would find these sequences across the tree of life, not only in the modern human genome, right? Uh, and then, um, so the next step was, you know, if so, we would also find these sequences encoded all throughout evolutionary history, including in extinct organisms and in, in living organisms, right? And uh, soon the brainstorming sessions in the lab turned into uh, sort of a bit fantastical, and uh, the concept of Jurassic Park uh, came, yes. came to, to our minds. And uh, of course, the, the main premise of Jurassic Park was to bring back to life entire organisms, mm -hmm. right? In that case, dinosaurs. Uh, but obviously, that had a lot of limitations, including ethical limitations and um, uh, ecological limitations. Right? What does it mean to bring back a dinosaur into our society? Uh, and uh, frankly, also technical limitations uh, in terms of insufficient genomic coverage and others, which I actually think make it impossible to bring back the uh, But, uh, you know, overcoming all those limitations, we thought of the concept of molecular dicks, you know, bringing back a molecule resurrecting a molecule from the past uh, to address antimicrobial resistance or other problems. And uh, since we had done the work with the modern human proteome, uh, we first decided to look at our, our closest ancestors, which are Neanderthals and Denisovans, which are extinct hominids, right? And uh, we developed a machine learning model that uh, took the proteomic data from Neanderthals, let's say, and it chewed it up in little pieces. And then we applied machine learning and human expert filters to predict whether those pieces would have a direct robot properties or not. And uh, 
They, we found many of these in the other of the Nisovans. And again, more humans as a reference, uh, proteome. And uh, the really, probably the most thrilling part of this project was when it came the time to resurrect the molecules using chemistry, right? So we found them on the computer, but then we had to actually make them in the lab. And um, for this, we use a technique called solid phase chemical synthesis, which allows us to actually make them. And these are these are encrypted peptides that are, uh, and as far as we know, not present in the living world today, not present in biology today. And so we're literally about to resurrect them. And uh, we're really excited to this from a scientific perspective. Uh, but we also started thinking about the ramifications yes. from a bioethical perspective. Mean? And so we started out uh, consulting with uh, with bioethicists and other people uh, to uh, sort of to make sure that we we innovated in a responsible manner, and, uh, and so that we would take into account every aspect that we needed. To take and that's an ongoing conversation still. Uh, but uh, you know, there, and, and I can show you one of them. I have a three D printed model here. Of one of the oh. ones from Neanderthals. This is actually, so this is a protein uh, encoded in the Neanderthal proteome, a genome, uh, which is um, ATP synthase subunit A. Uh, so this protein essentially makes ATP, which is a molecule that we all require uh, as a source of energy, uh, as a, an enabler in, in, the, in the body. And the algorithm found within this huge, complex, beautiful pro protein, we found this region in red. Uh, which uh, predicted that it would be antimicrobial. Oh, and, right? okay. And, uh, and then, so then we can extract it using chemistry. We can actually build it in the laboratory. And this, we call it Neanderthaling 1, because it's the first antibiotic from an extinct organism, in this case Neanderthals, that has antimicrobial properties in a preclinical animal model. Not only in vitro, in petri dishes, but also in a preclinical animal model. And... Um, I mean, this is just one example, but we've been able to do to do this with ancient humans. And uh, most recently, we posted a preprint where we uh, mined a, using a different model, in this case, a deep learning model, more complex model. Uh, we've mined the whole extinctome, and uh, we've been able to find uh, antibiotics in, for example, the woolly mammoth, the giant sloth, ancient seagrass, and many of these amazing creatures that used to exist at uh, one point in history. That's that's so amazing, Cesar, really. And, and, and thank you for sharing, for showing us as well. So for people that are just listening now, you have to go to our YouTube channel to check it out, this 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 printed 3D. It's it's really uh, fascinating. And I, I, you know, I can't imagine like also the, the security measures that you have to have when working with someone like that. Like, and I understand your focus on antimicrobial, uh, but, but just imagine that you know we could be dealing with something and creating like a a, a, a bag bacteria that was i don't know infecting dinosaurs or something like that so this is definitely uh not we don't have this risk right <laughs> no i mean i i you know the things that we took into account mm. were can this sequences that we're finding these small peptides and are they capable of self replication? Yeah, and right. uh, the answer was no. Okay. So, because one scenario was if they escape the lab and they're able to self replicate, yes. they might be able to sort of propagate. Uh, but that's not, that was not a concern in the sequences that we synthesized. And the other one is just simply uh, how we handle these sequences in molecules in a safe way. Is it and uh, we essentially put them in little vials and we put them, we started them in freezers. And so, um, you know, we, we sort of cover all these different layers of, of potential of safety course, of concerns. Course. Uh, but, uh, but in the end, the, you know, the conclusion was that the, uh, the, the, the potential uh, dangers are, are really, uh, really, really minimal uh, in this case. Because we're not talking about infectious agents or anything like that, you know, we're talking about molecules. And so, you know, this was one of the reasons why we thought it was, uh, it actually, Molecular de extinction address a lot of the limitation of, of organismal de extinction, or, you know, if you're trying to engineer infectious agents in the lab, which work. Yes, yes, I completely understand. And, and so, uh, Cesar, before I move to, to my last question, uh, is there any other projects that, that you're working on or you're planning to work on that you can share with us? Yeah, I think molecular de extinction is an entirely new field, so we're extremely excited. We it, it has allowed us to open up 
explore new sequence space in, mo in molecules and find you know, explore extinct organisms uh, as a source of potential therapeutics for the first time. Uh, it has also un helped us uncover potential immune effectors in, the, in these encrypted sequences that we think play a role in host immunity or cloud evolution. And it has helped us find templates that we think can be useful for, for further drug discovery. So I think really we're going to be really busy with um, trying to continue our work in, in monitor the extinction. And a lot of our work over the next couple of years is going to be along those lines. Yes. You know, monitor the extinction and AI for, for antibiotic discovery. That sounds really exciting, uh, Cesar. And you know, to our listeners uh, who are concerned about, you know, these uh, growing threats of super bacteria and future pandemies and, you know, from virus, uh, what are there any actions that you think individuals or communities could be taking? Are there any specific precautions or care steps that you recommend to, that, you know, would play a part in preventing and addressing these ongoing battles? Yeah, I think certainly trying to communicate that this is an issue, that this is a sil silent pandemic currently, and, and uh, you know, it kills over 1 billion people per year, so it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Um, I think the other thing uh, is trying to not uh, overuse antibiotics, right? So they're also often uh, prescribed for viral infections, but antibiotics don't work against viruses, so it's important to not uh, over overuse and abuse antibiotics. We need to use them as a sort of uh, treasure trove uh, that we need to preserve and we need to use only when needed. So I think uh, I don't know, those are two, two points, uh, two things that come to mind. No, and, and, and what you mentioned is super important. Do you think that uh, we are failing in controlling? Because this is something that affects everybody, right? Uh, if we have people getting, you know, those prescriptions, it's just that we're making the, the, these very same bacteria that are out there. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I was uh, reading, you know, you know, when preparing the interview, uh, one of the, the most, one of the main uh, differences is that when we're talking about virus, that virus, they don't survive outside, you know, a body. And as you're, you're mentioning, the bacteria, they, they can survive and, 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 and be there for decades and decades and then just fighting uh, their host, and then they they will be fine. So, you know, those super bacteria, they're like we, it's something that we are somehow responsible for that by maybe uh, lack of knowledge or, or 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 lack of qualification from doctors. I don't know what's the source. Do you think that we are not co having a control system strong enough to avoid that, or? Is it just unavoidable as, you know, the bacteria per se, they are already adapting, uh, uh, you know, without, you know, that kind of, of, of interference on, on our side? Did I make sense? I mean, but bacteria, uh, yeah, bacteria have this super... Yes, they are, they are already, yes, right. exactly. So, so, so they develop resistance rather quickly to a lot of antibiotics that we have in the clinic today. I think one thing that as scientists can do better is communicate this problem. But, but maybe even the, the, the public, you know, the general public, informing themselves of this problem and then communicating it to their communities. I think that would be, that would help spread at least the, the notion that we need to do something about um, antimicrobial resistance and that we need to do something about uh, trying to accelerate um, antibiotic discovery and trying to get more antibodies through the pipeline so we have them available in case we need them to treat untreatable infections. Okay, okay, good enough. So you know, uh, I, I hope I hope our, our listeners spread the news as well. And it was so interesting. Cesar, thank you so much for being here with us again. Uh, when I was listening to our first interview, and we will put the link uh, also on the description, so people make sure they for the Spanish speaking at least they 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 could hear you too. And and uh, I just had so many questions that I like I had to I have to go talk to Cesar again. So I really appreciate. Uh, and, you know, if you have any final message to our listeners, you know, the, the final words are yours. I mean, I, you know, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been an honor uh, sharing this, uh, this time with you. Um, I think for, for, for the audience, I think especially for the young ones, the young minds, uh, I think we, we live in an era of, you know, we're at this, the cusp of uh, many revolutions in, in biology. And uh, I would encourage young minds to think uh, beyond maybe becoming a soccer player, a football player, or a 
actress or a singer, uh, but to think about science as a, as a something that they devote their lives to. And um, uh, because I think through science, we can really help the world and we can really uh, come up with new innovations that really save, you can save millions of lives. And and, and, and yeah, so anyways, just uh, a little word of, uh, of uh, really, I'm really up optimistic about this, about the future of the world, uh, by our ability to improve it through science and technology. I absolutely love that. And I, I said that the last word was earth, but I have to comment on that. I absolutely love what you said. You know, I have a four year old girl and every time she complains something to me, like, you know, uh, she doesn't like vaccine because it hurts or uh, I'm, I'm medicine or anything like that. I'm like, you know, who knows? Maybe you're, you're going to invent something that is different. You know, maybe you're going to study and come up with something different. I'm just trying to put the STEM chip in her brain. You know, I hope it's not too too, too soon, but you know, I really, I really think people should be incentivizing people to, you know, let's go read and let's go find out and let's go study because there's an amazing world out there and and so much to learn, right? Exactly. The world is uh, the world of young minds and young people. So. Um, and you can you can shape it into uh, into any way any way you want, uh, you know through hard work and uh, through uh, dedicating yourself to it. But uh, but like I said, I think science is a great driver of progress. Love it. Thank you so much, uh, and Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for having me. Future Hacker Life Path Future.